Hello. Welcome to an adventure. Um, I hope that you all are having a good Wednesday. Um, and I apologize for the brief delay between when the timer ended and um, when I actually showed up on your screen. <sighs> I had a lot to get done as far as setup today. And so uh, I was racing until the very end. In fact, not 100% finished yet. Um, can't actually see chat at the moment. Give me a second here, because um, you all are supposed to be uh, arranged somewhat differently. Um, but I hope that you're having a great uh, day, and I hope that you're all ready to learn U.S. foreign relations from the 1980s, I think is the best description I can give to the collection that we're looking at today. Um, it sounds interesting to me. So uh, hopefully it sounds interesting to you. Um, and hopefully we learn some good stuff. Um, just grabbing all the windows I need. I need to drag them all over to a different spot. I usually get this done beforehand. Um. <clears throat> But yeah, today was <laughs> today was quite a bit of stuff that I had to get done in order to uh, make the stream happen. So, oh, you didn't think you'd be here today, Hannah, but you're here. Hello and welcome. Um, it is good to see you. I, I saw some of the chat. Um, let me see here what we can do to see the rest of the chat. If I could just like save the, the way that the windows are organized, that would be so lovely. Um, but as yet, I don't have a method of doing that. Um, so I'm vamping while I get things organized so that I can see what you all are saying. Um, okay. I think we're, we're doing slightly better here because at least on one of the channels, I can scroll up and see what you're saying now, uh, which includes, um, let me see. Hello, Lord Portico. It is wonderful to see you today. I hope that you're having a great day. Hello, Elixie. Uh, energy bridge and takes the station. <laughs> Ooh, Elixie, it, it is rare that you get to pop in anymore on a, on a Wednesday. It's lovely to see you. Um, report to the cake replicator. Yes. Awesome. Uh, okay. And I see, let's see, I see Shadows of Life. Hello. Uh, Consilience. Hi. Uh, yes, I got everything set up. And it, it was later than I hoped, but everything's in place. We're live. The settings for the um, green screen are not as good as they were before, but the lights in the room, I reset as best I could. Um, <clears throat> that like the room was used for something else between my last stream in here and uh, this one. And so I had to reset it to what I need it to be. Um, engineering, uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> I love the um, discussion in the chat about uh, marking year anniversaries of things. Okay, <clears throat> we are a go. Let's see, makes sense, confections. All right, I have caught up on the chat. It's lovely that you all were able to join me today. And uh, we're gonna be looking at some archival materials. So how about we find out what those things are? 
that we're going to be looking at. Plus, um, as always, uh, we're going to start off today by um, <clears throat> taking a look at the land recognition and or land acknowledgement and labor recognition. Uh, so I have that ready to pop up here. Thank you for dropping the command, Hannah. I don't know why it didn't work. Maybe it was, uh, I think it, it, it was slightly misspelled, but you know, that is okay. I need to be able to see this. All right, here goes. I have, I have given a try to getting things set to a good state again. Hopefully you all can see this and hear me, the music and me. Um, <clears throat> these are the land acknowledgement and labor recognition from the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, uh, inclusive.bt.edu, which is behind me. Um, we can fix that later. Uh, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that, it, that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute. And they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through Inclusive BT, the institutional and individual commitment to a prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so, we should take a look at what exactly this collection is going to be that we're going to be uh, exploring today, which we shall do very shortly once I have it pulled up in, uh, in the browser that I can show you all. Um, that was another thing I didn't quite get to. Uh, we're almost there. Okay, here we go. success. Uh, <clears throat> Today we're looking at the Alice Langley Shea papers uh, from 1943 to 1978. Yes, historical terms right now. Thank you, Lord Portico. That, Lord Portico? Uh, Lord Portico, um, indeed. Uh, the historical terms command is definitely going to be useful today. Um, and if you're uncertain why, you'll see very shortly. Um, also, I don't know why, this is the print view for the finding aid, which I thought might show better on, um, on stream. And you'll note some of the headings on the left go off the side of the screen. And I'm not certain why, but I didn't do the formatting, so. Um, yeah, so the Alice Langley Shea Papers, 1943 to 1978, there are eight boxes, uh, totaling approximately eight cubic feet. Um, it's generally kept in our off-site storage. Uh, I've had it in my office for the past month. 
and it consists of three parts. The personal papers and publications of Alice Lang Lichet, uh, born 1922 and died 1979, a U.S. State Department, RAND Corporation, and Institute for the Defense Analyses uh, Specialist on the Military of the People's Republic of China. The manuscripts of books written by her spouse, uh, C. Tian She, himself an authority on communist China. I'm not certain on the pronunciation of his name. Um, I did my best. <clears throat> and uh, three, collateral publications from uh, Alice Lang Lichet's Library on the Chinese People's Liberation Army, uh, the Maoist Cultural Revolution, Chinese Nuclear Capability, Japanese Security Forces, and other Far Eastern topics and issues. So, <clears throat> not, you know, weighty topics in any way, right? Um, that said, it sounds like an amazing collection. Uh, so, a, a little bit of biographical information about Alice Edith Langley, um, which was her birth name. Uh, <clears throat> She graduated from Queens College in Flushing, New York in 1943 and then did graduate work at Clark University, Stanford University, and George Washington University, uh, where she did history and international relations, history and U.S. foreign policy, and the law, respectively. <clears throat> and then also the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where she studied graduate work or did graduate studies in Chinese. She became an international relations officer and foreign services officer for the Bureau of Far Eastern Affairs at the U.S. State Department from 1945 to 1955, so immediately following World War II. She was a member of the U.S. delegation to the Far Eastern Commission, 1946 to 1952, and in 1951, she served as special assistant to the U.S. political, or yeah, special assistant to the U.S. political advisor to the supreme commander of the Allied Powers in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, assistant to a, the advisor to the commander. So, two steps removed. Still, that's a pretty influential spot to be in. From 55 to 58, uh, Shea served as a consultant to the RAND Corporation and became a member of the RAND senior staff, specializing in um, communist China's foreign policy, military doctrine and developments, including nuclear, internal army party relations, Sino-Japanese relations, and general security matters in the Far East. And in 1969, she joined the International and Social Studies Division of the Institute for Defense Analyses, as a research staff member, continuing to specialize in the same areas. Uh, early 70s, she was incapacitated by a serious illness, regaining a limited level of activity in 1974. She continued to write, do research, and accumulate reference materials through 1978, but her active publication period is confined to the earlier years. She served as a consultant to the U.S. State Department throughout her latter career and appeared several times before congressional committees testifying on communist China's nuclear capability and intentions and on the development of a U.S. anti-China, anti-ballistic missile system. She died in November of 1979. So, <clears throat> you're welcome to peruse uh, further in the finding aid, uh, which was linked in the chats. Um, if you want to see exactly what is present in the collection, uh, it's divided into three series, Alice's papers, her husband's papers, and then um, basically I would call it essentially research materials. It's, it's subject files containing reference materials collected by her throughout her career. Um, so there is a rather lengthy container list that when I was going through it is somewhat confusing um, because it lists it lists documents multiple times under different headings um, which 
took me a second to catch on to. Uh, but that's fine. It just means you might discover that something's in the collection uh, more than one way. Uh, the first thing that caught my eye, and I was I was trying so hard. I wanted to like get into the collection and have a chance to sort of glance through and skim stuff before the stream. Um, did not manage to. So the best I've got so far is I went through the finding aid and marked things that sounded interesting. And the first of those is located in box one. So I think that's where, where we will start. But as always, if you see something listed in the finding aid that you're interested in and you would like me to bring out onto the stream, let me know because I will do so. <clears throat> okay. These are all fairly large archival boxes full of many, many folders. The um, finding aid does not number the folders, uh, nor are they numbered in the box. So it might take me slightly longer to find a folder that is listed than like normal, but they are still listed. And all of the boxes came from storage with what appears to be some water damage, but it seems confined just to the exterior of the boxes. Um, I, in looking at it, I have not noticed any water damage to the contents. Um, if there is some, maybe we'll discover it. I don't know. So the first thing that I noticed was in box one, there is uh, so box one includes correspondence, and one of the correspondence items is titled From Brownlee Hayden with materials on Edgar Snow, including his interview with Mao Zedong. And I thought, that sounds interesting. Uh, so if I can find it, we will look at it. I am uncertain where it will be though. I'm actually gonna pull. I'm gonna pull folders out of here because I'll be able to flip through them faster that way. I don't know when this was processed. Uh, we, we always have folder numbers now. now I'm looking because I'm curious we, we don't know it was it was uh, it was done sometime prior to 2006 and then um, it was it was processed and there was a paper finding aid and in 2010 we converted that paper finding aid to uh, the online one that exists now so we don't know who processed it or when uh, so, Sino-Soviet Nuclear Dialogue, 1963. Uh, Hinton, Helpert, Swearington, Rand. New Stage of the Cultural Revolution, PLA in Polities. Sino-Soviet Relations. Progress of the Cultural Revolution. I'm, I'm looking for specifically that Mao Zedong one, because that was the one I marked. All of these sound interesting. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I thought I had them positioned so you could see the titles as I was as I was moving things. Um, okay. So it's the third one listed in the finding aid. Clearly not the third folder in the box. No, no. Huh. Well, that's not all the correspondence. 
more correspondence. Okay, let's see. Two, circular letter. Oh. Okay. Well, I am learning that some of our older files, or some of our older um, collections are not processed super well. Well, I, let's just say, this one is not processed helpfully for uh, finding a specific folder within a box. Haha! -ha, I have found it. I don't understand why it was organized that way, but who knows? Maybe that is the order they were in when they came to us, um, which is often the case. <clears throat> but then having folder numbers would be so much more helpful. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, this is the from Brownlee Hayden. Uh, with Edgar Snow's interview with Mao Zedong. Oh dear. Trying to, uh... It's a bulky collection. There's lots of space necessary. Okay. Edgar Snow interview with Mao Zedong. Attached to this note, you will find interview with Mao, New Republic, February 27, 1965, and China and the War, Candide, 11 to 18 February 1965, plus two additional Snow articles. Uh, huh. I don't know why U.S. View shows up as a um, link in that message, but eh. <laughs> oh, did the was the link not working? The short one. I don't know. I. I thought I had updated everything, but thank you, Lord Portico. If it was not updated, thank you very much for updating it. My apologies. Um, is it... Oh, that's weird. That's super weird. Is it um, incorrect on the other channel as well? I ask as I now go to check. Somehow, I think it's actually correct on, on the other channel. It was just on that channel that it was wrong. Who knows? Who truly knows why? Uh, <clears throat> All right, I have compared the English and French versions. The French version omits about 40 lines in which Snow and Mao discuss the authenticity of certain essays attributed to Mao, also omitted from U.S. newspaper versions. Uh, for example, L.A. Times, Washington Post. I have marked the portions of the French version that have been omitted from the New Republic version. Brownlee Hayden. Enclosures, NR Interview, Candide Series. You went to look at the finding aid here and open another tab to this channel. Well, you know, maybe, maybe I was just trying to drive up my numbers. I don't know. Um, I vaguely know the names uh, Brownlee Hayden and um, Edgar Snow. Like they feel familiar, but. 
this is before my time, so I'm like, were these like household names? The name that really catches my eye with this is Mao. Uh, <laughs> these look like, okay, so these are like copies of newspapers, I think. <clears throat> Le nouveau candide. Il avait le jugement assez droit avec l'esprit le plus simple. C'est, I'm sure it sounds horrible if you actually speak French. Uh, C'est, je crois, pour c'était récent quand le nommé candide. Voltaire. Uh, I did not know that I was going to be looking at a French document today, and I did not come prepared to translate it. Um, which is fine. We'll skip past it pretty quickly and go to the English ones. But also, I took one year of French, and it was in the sixth grade. So, yeah. Actually, yeah. No. Fifth grade. I took it when I was young. I don't know. I don't remember when. It was a long time ago. Le Chine et la Guerre en Priority Mondial. Mondial? Mondial. First interview with Mao Zedong. Like, it's a photocopy of a newspaper, but you can still see the outline of his head. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on past. So they've marked, uh, in the letter, they said they marked sections. that are in this French version that were not in the New Republic as published in English. Wait, why? All right, I'm going to try turning it off and on again, as suggested. Why? The, the one thing I did not check was um, whether the cameras were actually connected to power. So, you know, I guess it's a good thing that they um, worked at all. Usually if the one pointed at me has been disconnected from power, it would have shut off by now too. But see, now that I touched it, now it's all shaky. And I, I don't know when it's going to stop shaking. So, apologies. <laughs> uh, yes. And now I've lost my camera control because it disconnected from the net. So bear with me for one more second here while I reinitialize that. Honestly, it would not be this stream without at least a little bit of um, technical difficulties, right? Okay. Put that window back because it won't let me turn that on without increasing the size of the window. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. Recovered. <clears throat> okay. I thought there was supposed to be some English in here, because I'm not prepared to try and read French at the moment, uh, nor did I prepare for 
um, non-English documents today. I could pull out my phone and use an automated translator, but I am not going to because there's plenty of other things to look at. Interview with Mao by Edgar Snow. So I don't know, uh, but I'm going to ask. Is there anybody watching who remembers this time uh, and possibly was paying attention to this when it was going on? Like I said, this is a bit before my time. Uh, but I do know that we occasionally get some viewers for, who, for whom this probably would have been right uh, within their time period. I don't know what I mean by that, but who possibly would have been paying attention while this was going on? <clears throat> Peking. In a rare interview which lasted about four hours, Mao Zedong conversed with me on topics ranging over what he himself called uh, Shanman Hai Pei, or from south of the mountains to north of the seas. So I take it that that means um, a wide range of topics. Uh, with China's bountiful 200 million tons 1964 grain harvest taxing winter storage capacities with Sorry, Windows wanted to update and it distracted me for a second. Um, with shops everywhere offering inexpensive foods and consumer goods necessities, and with technological and scientific advances cl climaxed by an atomic bang that saluted Khrushchev's political demise, Chairman Mao might well have claimed a few creative achievements. I found him reflecting on man's rendezvous with death and ready to leave the assessment of his political legacy to future generations. The 72-year-old warrior greeted me in one of the spacious Peking decor rooms of the Great Hall of the People, across the wide square facing Tiananmen and or, uh, the heavenly peace gate uh, of the former Forbidden City. During our conversation, he repeatedly thanked foreign invaders for speeding up the Chinese Revolution and for bestowing similar favors in Southeast Asia today. Oh boy. <clears throat> he asserted that China has no troops outside her own frontiers and has no intention of fighting anybody unless her own territory is attacked. He observed that the more American weapons and troops brought into Saigon, the faster the South Vietnamese Liberation Forces would become armed and educated to win victory. By now, they did not need the help of Chinese troops. So this is an interview. Uh, the interviewer was um, Edgar Snow. Uh, we have a little bio on him here, reported often at first hand on the Chinese communists uh, before and since their conquest of the mainland. In the 30s, he was assistant editor of the China Weekly Review, correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, lecturer at Yenching University in Peking, uh, he covered the Sino-Japanese War in 1931 to 1933 and 1937 to 1941. Formerly an associate editor of the Saturday Evening Post and a correspondent for Look Magazine, uh, the author of Red Star Over China, The Battle for Asia, and The Other Side of the River, Red China Today. The interview with Mao Zedong published here took place several weeks ago during a two-month visit to China before the recent U.S. and South Vietnamese airstrikes against North Vietnam. Lovely. Uh, it, I don't see a date on the article. Um, that does not seem to have been preserved. Oh, February 27th, 1965 is when this article was published. Um, huh. At the start of our conversation, Chairman Mao agreed to be photographed informally in a film I believe to be the first ever made of him for foreign television. 
From this film, political clinicians may make their own diagnosis of his condition, lately rumored to be much deteriorated, on January 9th, coming at the end of strenuous weeks of daily and nightly conferences with many regional leaders drawn to the Capitol for the annual National People's Congress, his talk with me might have been more speedily terminated by a sick man. He seemed wholly relaxed throughout our conversation, which began before six, continued during dinner, and went on for about two hours after. What's funny is the way that this is described feels very much like it would be today as well. Like, they haven't even gotten to, like, anything substantive. It's all description of the setting at this point. Painting the scene. Um, I don't know. Okay, so this is, um, February 27, 1965 issue of The New Republic, which is a magazine, um, is, is where this article appeared. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I will read this section on China and the bomb, and then we will move to another document, unless people are stupendously interested in this and, and, and shout for me to um, continue with this specific document. But like I said, there's eight boxes. Um, and it's all sort of this time period and this topical area. So, <clears throat> question, do you still believe that the bomb is a paper tiger? That had just been a way of talking, he said, a kind of figure of speech. Of course the bomb could kill people. But in the end, the people would destroy the bomb. Then it would truly become a paper tiger. Uh, you have been quoted as saying that China had less fear of the bomb than other nations because of her vast population. Other peoples might be totally wiped out, but China would still have a few hundred millions left to begin anew. Was there ever any factual basis to such reports? He answered that he had no recollection of saying anything like that, but he might have said it. He did recall a conversation he had had with um, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, when the latter visited China in 1954, as he remembered it. Uh, he had said, China did not want a war. They didn't have atom bombs, but if other countries wanted to fight, there would be a catastrophe in the whole world, meaning that many people would die. As for how many, nobody could know. He was not speaking only of China. He did not believe one atom bomb would destroy, destroy all mankind so that you would not be able to find a government to negotiate peace. He mentioned this to Nehru during their conversation. Nehru said that he was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission of India and he knew about the destructiveness of atomic power. He was sure that no one could survive. Mao replied, it would probably not be as Nehru said. Existing governments might disappear, but others would arise to replace them. <clears throat> not so long ago, Khrushchev said that he had a deadly weapon capable of killing all living things. But then he immediately retracted his statement, not only once, but many times. Mao would not deny anything he had said nor did he wish me to deny for him this so-called rumor about China's millions uh, power of survival in a nuclear war. Americans also had said very much about the destructiveness of the atom bomb and Khrushchev uh, had made a big noise about that. They had all surpassed him in this respect so that he was more backward than they was not that so. Yet recently, he had read reports of an investigation by Americans who visited the Bikini Islands six years after the nuclear tests had been conducted there. From 1959 onwards, research workers had been in Bikini. When they first entered the island, they had had to cut open paths through the undergrowth. They found mice scampering about and fish swimming in the streams as usual. The well water was potable, plantation foliage was flourishing and birds were twittering in the trees. Probably there had been two bad years after the tests, but nature had gone on. In the eyes of nature and the birds, the mice and the trees, the atom bomb was a paper tiger. Possibly man has less stamina than they. 
Nevertheless, you would not exactly consider nuclear war to be a good thing. Certainly not, he replied. If one must fight, one should confine oneself to conventional weapons. Indonesia had withdrawn from the United Nations, I observed, accompanied by applause from China. Did Mao Zedong think the move would set a precedent and that other withdrawals would follow? <laughs> Lord Portico, thank you for the hydrate. I will, I will take a drink. <clears throat> Mao said that it was the United States which had first set the precedent by excluding China from the United Nations. Now the, that a majority of nations might favor restoring China's seat despite U.S. opposition, there was a new scheme to require a two-thirds majority instead of a simple majority. But the question was, did China gain or lose by being outside the UN during the past 15 years? <clears throat> Indonesia had left because she felt that there was not much advantage to remaining in the UN. As for China, was it not in itself a United Nations? Any one of several of China's minority nationalities was larger in population and territory than some states in the UN whose votes had helped deprive China of her seat there. China was a large country with plenty of work to keep her busy outside the UN. Is it now practicable to consider forming a union of nations excluding the United States? Mao pointed out that such forums already existed. One example was the Afro-Asian Conference. Another was uh, GANEFO, Games of the New Emerging Forces organized after the United States, excluded China from the Olympics. <clears throat> Whoa, this is a very lengthy um, parenthetical. Uh, preparations for the Afro-Asian conference scheduled to open in Algiers in March had been plagued by many problems. These included the Indonesia-Malaysia uh, dispute and insistence on the part of the pro-China Bandung powers that the USSR must be excluded from the conference as a strictly European power. There is reason to believe that China regards the Afro-Asian organization as the potential center of planned development of a third world largely independent of neo-colonial or Western capital, following Chinese principles of self-reliance in internal development and of mutual help between the Afro-Asian states, the process of modernization might be so speeded up as to bypass the slow and painful method of capital accumulation by traditional bourgeois means. Such a theoretical alternative would, of course, imply more rapid and radical political evolution and an earlier arrival at pre-socialist conditions in the capital-poor Afro-Asian states uh, um, outside the context of this interview, it may be added that it has been obvious for some time that the Afro-Asian Conference is also viewed as a potential permanent assembly of the have-not nations to exist independently from the American-dominated United Nations from which China and her closest allies have long been excluded and which Indonesia has recently left. In fact, Mr. Chairman, how many people are there? inside China's own, quote, United Nations, I asked. Can you give me a population figure resulting from the recent census? The chairman replied that he really did not know. Some said that there were 680 to 690 million, but he did not believe it. How could there be so many? When I suggested that it ought not to be difficult to calculate on the basis of ration coupons, cotton and rice alone, he indicated that the peasants had sometimes confused the picture. Before liberation, they had hidden births and kept some off the register out of fear of having them conscripted. Since liberation, there had been a tendency to report greater numbers and less land, and to minimize output returns while exaggerating the effects of calamities. Nowadays, a new birth is reported at once, but if someone dies, it may not be reported for months. His implications seem to be that, the, that extra rash, uh, ration coupons could be accumulated in that way. No doubt, there had been a real decline in the birth rate, but the peasants were still too slow to adopt family planning. There had been a decline uh, ba -ba -ba. 
there had been a decline, I lost my spot. In, there had been a decline in the birth rate, but the decline in the death rate was even greater. Longevity had increased about 30 years of age uh, to a life expectancy of around 50. That was the kind of answer, I said, which was calculated to give foreign professors lots of work to do. What kind of professors were those, now asked. He was interested to hear that I had attended a conference where professors had debated whether he had, or had not, made any original contributions to Marxism. I told him that I had asked one professor at the close of such a conference whether it would make any difference in their controversy if it could be shown that Mao himself had never claimed to have made any creative contribution. The professor said no. Mao was amused. More than 2,000 years ago, he remarked, uh, Chuang Shou wrote his immortal essay on Lao Tzu called the Chuang Tzu. A hundred schools of thought then arose to dispute the meaning. <laughs> this is actually a very entertainingly written article. Um, I, I, I like that being the first sample that we looked at uh, from this collection because I thought it was interesting. But I'm not going to read the entire article because that would take quite a lot of stream time and there's other things to see that might be even better. Let's see, uh, box one in the section personal files, there was a, there's an item labeled file on the U.S. North Korea relations including Pueblo incident. I am not familiar with what the Pueblo incident is. Uh, which is part of why this caught my eye. Because I am curious and would like to learn. All right, let me, let me try and find this though. What was it called? US North Korea relations. PLA, 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 PLA. There's a lot of stuff in here on the PLA apparently. Ah, I have located the folder of interest. And again, if you happen to see something in the finding aid um, that strikes your interest, let me know, because I will locate the folder, we'll pull it out and have a look, see what's there. I'm happy to do that. All right, so files regarding North Korea Pueblo incident. <clears throat> like I said, I have no idea what the Pueblo incident refers to. So let's find out. GGG1, North Korea. 25 January 1968. This appears to be a draft of an article. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to read it and we'll find out. Captain of captured armed spy ship confesses. Pyongyang in Korea, and, uh, I think that's supposed to be Korea. Pyongyang in Korea to South Korea, uh, 2200 GMT, 24 January 1968. Um, verbatim text of statement ascribed to Commander Lloyd Mark Butcher, captain of USS Pueblo broadcast in English following introduction in Korean. Quote, Commander Lloyd Mark Butcher, captain of the captured U.S. imperialist aggressor forces, armed 
spy vessel Pueblo made the following confessions regarding the uh, perpetration of criminal espionage activities after intruding into the coastal waters of the DPRK. Uh, unquote. DPRK, of course, if anyone is not familiar, being the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is North Korea's name for themselves. Uh, the radio does not state that the following is in Commander Butcher's own voice. Text. I am Commander Lloyd Mark Butcher, captain of the USS Pueblo belonging to the Pacific Fleet U.S. Navy, who was captured while carrying out espionage activities after intruding deep into the territorial waters of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. My serial number is 5821-5401. I was born in Pocatello, Idaho, USA. I'm 38 years old. The crew of our USS Pueblo are 83. In all, including five officers besides me, 75 servicemen, and two civilians. My ship had been sent to Sasebo, Japan, to execute assignments given by, given by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. On 2 December last, we received assignments from your port, uh, square brackets, Pyongyang, KCNA at 1702 GMT, 24 January says, quote, assignments at the port, unquote. Close the, um, the insert bracket. Uh, of Sasebo from Rear Admiral Frank A. Johnson, U.S. Navy commander in Japan, to conduct military espionage activities on the far eastern region of the Soviet Union and then on the offshore areas and coastal areas of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Pyongyang, KCNA, International English at 1702 GMT on 24 January uses the initials DPRK. Okay. Uh, I think, am I correct in interpreting that KCNA is the, um, initials for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in Korean. And that KCR or KCNA and DPRK are the same. It's just one is the English initials and one is the Korean initials. I think that's what I'm getting there. My ship had conducted espionage activities on a number of occasions uh, for the purpose of detecting the territorial waters of the socialist countries. Uh, through such espionage activities, my ship detected the military installations set up along the coasts of the socialist countries and submitted the materials to the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Pyongyang KCNA International English at 1702 GMT on 24 January uses the initials CIA. Uh, recently, we were given another assignment mission by the U.S. Central U.S. Intelligence Agency. Uh, Pyongyang KCNA International English at 1702 GMT on 24 January said, quote, another important mission, unquote, and uses initials U.S., quote, CIA, unquote. Uh, that is, to detect the areas along the far east of the Soviet Union and North Korea. Uh... That's a really lengthy insert. Uh, Pyongyang, KCNA International English at 1702 GMT on 24 January uses, quote, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, unquote. Pyongyang International English English to Southeast Asia at 0805 GMT on 25 January uses, quote, Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, unquote. And the phrase, quote, Democratic People's Republic of, Unquote, may have been dubbed in on the original tape, since the volume of this phrase is noticeably lower than the rest of the statement. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, Pyongyang KCNA International English at 1702-1702 GMT, on 24 January uses the initials U.S. CIA. <clears throat> Promise me that if this task should be done successfully, a lot of dollars would be offered to the whole crew of my ship, and particularly I myself would be honored. Oh boy.
So, all right, let's 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 see if we can skim and get the rest of this. Uh, soon after that, I reinforced the arms and equipment of the ship and made detailed espionage preparations for espionage activities. I'm sure that somebody said exactly those words because that was some slight sarcasm there. But that does not sound like normal phraseology. <laughs> At least normal English phraseology. Reinforced the arms of the equi and equipment of the ship and made detailed espionage preparations for espionage activities. Uh, then we disguised my ship as one engaged in researches of oceanographic electronics and left the port of Sasebo, Japan and conducted espionage acts along the coast of North Korea. via the general area off the Soviet Maritime Province. We pretended ourselves to conduct the observation of oceanographic conditions on high seas, electronics, research, and on electronic waves, magnetic conditions, and exploitation uh, Sorry the computer showing me the chat decided to go to sleep. This is, this is wonderful. I love the technical difficulties. Um, lost where I was, but basically a forced confession, it looks like, about pretending to do science in order to spy on North Korea after, I, after the USS Pueblo was captured. I don't know how I've never heard of this incident. Maybe it wasn't a big incident? Maybe it didn't really matter a bunch? I had never heard of the USS Pueblo. not chatty enough. I don't know that it's that. It's just that I had spent so long on the um, document that I was looking at that I hadn't moved my mouse enough. Um, I don't know. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what this is. Foreign comment on Pueblo incident review. Pyongyang, January 6th. Friends of fighting countries in Asia and Africa hail as their own the great victory of the Korean people who abased the pride of the arrogant U.S. imperialists and brought them to their knees in the incident of the U.S. imperialist armed spy ship Pueblo, which conducted espionage activities after intruding deep into the territorial waters of our country. According to a VNA report from Hanoi, the Liberation Radio of the South Vietnam National Front for Liberation said in a commentary recently that the U.S. government apologized for the heinous hostile acts committed by the armed spy ship Pueblo in the territorial waters of the 
uh, DPRK. It pointed out this is a heavy defeat for U.S. imperialism and a great victory for the armed forces and people of the DPRK and for the freedom and justice-loving people of the whole world. The fact that the U.S. government apologized shows that the day has gone never to return when the U.S. imperialists could perpetrate piratic acts. Interesting. I've never really paid a whole lot of attention to North Korea. Um, so, seeing what are essentially transcriptions of um, internal broadcasts, like messages that were intended for consumption by the people of North Korea. Are it's kind of interesting because I've never I've never seen like the internal propaganda messages of North Korea before. New York Times. August 31st, 1969. <clears throat> so on the left there is a picture of Kim Il-sung, who was North Korean premier at the time. It seemed like the rerun of a bad old movie. The scene last week once again was the joint security area of Han Munjom and the players were again the chief American and North Korean negotiators of the Military Armistice Commission. The script too was familiar. The Korean demanded that the United States apologize for its alleged, quote, criminal activities, unquote, as the condition for the return of American servicemen held captive in North Korea. Less than a year ago, the North Koreans confronted the Americans at Panmunjom with a demand for an apology to effect the release of the crew of the captured intelligence ship Pueblo. The United States did produce the apology and then repudiated it when the Pueblo crew was released. This time, the North Koreans are holding the injured three-man three crew of a United States Army helicopter that was shot down after it strayed over the border into North Korean airspace on August 17th. The United States may once again decide to give the required apology in order to free the captured Americans. And following the precedent set after the Pueblo incident and the destruction of a United States intelligence airplane by North Koreans last spring, Washington probably will eschew any re retaliatory action against Pyongyang. Huh. I'm, I'm encountering portions of mid-20th century history that I, I've never really encountered before. Like, I was aware of things like the Korean War, and I'm aware of um, China and Korea and uh, stuff like that, generally in a historical sense, but I've never gone like to this level of detail to where these would be familiar topics. I think it's kind of cool. Let's see. What else do we have? I marked uh, background on Nixon's administration, or Nixon administration's Vietnam and China policies. I marked test ban and non-proliferation treaties. Let's see what else I marked. Um. That one sounds interesting. I mean, I marked them all. The, the, the ones I marked all sound interesting, but... <clears throat> Box three. Alice Langley Shea, uh, testimony before Jackson Subcommittee on Military Uses of Atomic Energy. That sounds interesting. And I'll just mention again, if anybody watching uh, happens to see something listed that 
sounds interesting to them and that they would like to see on screen, let me know. Just need to uh, shift things slightly so I can get this box. Okay. We are now going to dive into box three so that I can find whatever I just said. <laughs> Under the anti-ballistic missiles section. Which I don't see. I think maybe it's under publications. Or testimony. Testimony. It should be congressional testimony, right? Yes. Jackson Subcommittee on Military Uses of Atomic Energy. Ooh. I will say this is the hardest, uh, this is the most difficult to use finding aid that I have encountered in our collections. Controls for the camera have stopped working. I wish to zoom. Or I, I wish to change the zoom level of the camera, please. Hello, camera. Our camera is still functional. The website controlling the camera, however, is not. Seriously, I can't control the camera. Oh, how frustrating. Well, there are other ways. Am I going outward or inward? Nope, I'm just making it blurry. Zoom. Zoom? Uh. The problem with doing it this way is it makes everything shaky. Nope, that doesn't do it. I, I don't know. It's fine. I mean, I can I can function with this, but I was going to show you like the entire stack of papers, and that is apparently not going to be something that I do because the website that lets me control the zoom level of the camera isn't loading. It came with a remote control, but to actually use the remote control costs. Like, the, it needs an adapter or something, and it costs like 500 some dollars. So, not exactly something we were going to do. I have no idea. You know, I'm going to restart the camera, I think, again. Because that has fixed it before. I appreciate everybody bearing with me during the um, random and unexpected technical difficulties regarding the uh, overhead camera. <clears throat> Give it a second. Wow. Oh. 
I, I have located an artifact that I'm sure some of you will enjoy learning about um, and others might find horrifying. Uh, if, if you've ever worked in archives, you'll probably find what I found to be horrifying. At least, the website is loading. The, um, oh, yes. Success, camera functions. Okay. Woo. Hannah, have a good time. I hope you really enjoy it. Um, I look forward to hearing, uh, how everything went in the Discord, although it does not have to be tonight. Um, just focus on enjoying the show. Um, there's a, a, a rubber band, and actually this one is not as bad as some. It's not sticky, it's not crumbly, it's not stuck to the pages, it's still relatively pliable. So this, this is actually the best case scenario for an old rubber band found in an archival collection. Rubber bands are one of the most disgusting things you can find in a collection. Because the way they age is not pleasant. I will be disposing of that one. Um, okay. Opening statement by Senator Henry M. Jackson, Chairman, Military Applications Subcommittee, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, Anti-Ballistic Missile Hearing, Monday, November 6, 1967, 2 p.m. The Subcommittee on Military Applications of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy opens its hearings today on the problems of anti-ballistic missile defense, a field in which the Joint Committee has had a long and continuing interest. Senator John C. Pa er, John O. Pastore, Chairman of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, in a major policy address in connection with the launching of the nuclear submarine Narwhal at Groton, Connecticut, on September 9, 1967, announced that the Military Applications Subcommittee would un undertake a thorough study and review of this subject. These hearings will review the plans and programs relating to our ABM program. In the context of three recent developments of utmost seriousness, which relate to the credibility of the Western nuclear deterrent. First is the fact of the Soviet offensive buildup. Moscow has been working hard to narrow the missile gap that limited its range of, of options in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. It has recently doubled the number of its operational ICBMs. Also, the larger missile payload the Soviets can mount on their bigger missiles gives them the capability to deploy higher yield nuclear warheads per missile than we can. A second development is the Soviet defense buildup. The Soviet leaders have deployed an ABM system around Moscow, and our best intelligence is that they will expand and improve that system over the years. A third important d development is the emergence of Red China as a thermonuclear power. With the advantages, this will give China to exploit the weaknesses or the weakness of its neighbors, unless it has reason to fear the consequences. The main purpose of these hearings is twofold. We want to bring to the Congress and the public the latest information on plans by the Executive Department concerning the United States Anti-Ballistic Missile Program. The decision announced on September 18, 1967, that our government would undertake the development of a so-called thin ABM defense has significant implications for our national security. We expect the, reason, uh, the responsible officials within the bounds of security to discuss in public and in detail this recently announced program. I believe it is important <clears throat> that as much information as possible should be made available to the American people 
so that they can better understand the issues involved. It is also our sincere hope that these hearings will help to make clear some of the longer-term problems of ballistic missile defense as they relate to maintaining the credibility of the Western deterrent, which is the first essential of our national security and individual liberty and of the survival of our allies in freedom. Let me say a word about the meaning of deterrence. What I mean by deterrence is a combination of forces in being and state of mind about the credibility of those forces. Western deterrent must be credible to the adversary. If Soviet rulers came to believe that their ballistic missile defense, coupled with a nuclear attack on the United States, would limit damage to the Soviet Union to a level acceptable to them, whatever the level is, our forces would no longer be a reliable deterrent. The Western deterrent must be reassuring to our allies. If our allies came to believe that the Russians had an effective ABM system and knew that we did not, their confidence in the American deterrent and their will to resist Soviet blackmail would be undermined. The Western deterrent must be reassuring to the country and to the American president. If a president came to believe that the Soviets had a relatively effective ABM system and knew that the United States did not, this could inhibit our government from standing firm in a period of crisis. Hi, Puddle Glum. Welcome. Uh, under conditions where the credibility of the Western deterrent was in question, the Soviet Union would be emboldened to take greater risks in expanding the frontiers of its influence, for example, by moving on Berlin or by acting adventurously in the Middle East or elsewhere. The circumstances would thus be created for the most dangerous confrontation. Uh, a showdown between nuclear powers in which Moscow did not feel deterred by our forces. During these hearings, which are expected to extend into next year, we will also review the implementation of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty safeguards jointly uh, or Nuclear Test Ban Treaty safeguards jointly with members of the Nuclear Safeguards Subcommittee of the State Senate Armed Services Committee. This is an annual review in connection with the annual report to the Senate on the implementation of the safeguards program. I might also note that the Preparedness Committee of the Senate Armed Services Committee and its staff have been following closely the main developments affecting the, all, oh, oh, the overall east-west balance of strategic forces. They are continuing their work in that area under the able leadership of the chairman of the Preparedness Subcommittee, Senator John Stennis. We welcome as our first witnesses in these hearings the Honorable Paul H. Uh, Knight, Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Dr. John S. Foster, Director, Defense Research and Engineering, Department of Defense. Mr. Knight, will you proceed? Okay. Ugh. Ooh. Puddle Glum, I'm very happy that you're having a happy No Migraines Day. Um, I think it said that there was supposed to be actual like remarks from... Hmm, maybe not from her. Also, hello! <coughs> Welcome in, Whimsies. Hi, 16-Bit Eric. Thank you so much for bringing everybody over uh, to join us today for Archival Adventures. Um, <laughs> 16 Bite Rick, yes. Um, only don't bite Rick. Um, if you are unfamiliar, this is Archival Adventures. It is a weekly show that I do sharing materials from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, and so, I find something that seems like it might be interesting and we spend some time looking at it, seeing what's there and uh, learning about something usually. Uh, this week we're looking at the Alice Langley Shea papers um, and she was a knowledgeable individual uh, with regard to Far East countries, especially China, um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, she was an advisor to uh, several high up politicians in the United States uh, regarding issues of um, Far East military preparedness and nuclear capability, uh, beginning just after World War II and uh, proceeding up until her death in 1979. So. Uh, right now, I'm in a folder titled 
congressional testimony, notes, presentations, and reviews of appearance before Jackson Subcommittee on Military Uses of Atomic Energy. Um, and we're just seeing what's here. That said, uh, there is a finding aid for the collection that lists what the titles of the folders are, and you're welcome to peruse the finding aid. Uh, and if you see something that jumps out at you and you're like, I'd like to see what that is, let me know and I'll bring it up on screen and we'll see what's there. So um, I don't know, I didn't see if Lord Portico dropped the link to the finding aid after the raid or not. So, oh, there it is. Uh, okay. So right now I'm just looking to see, we, we read the opening remarks from uh, the congressperson who was leading this subcommittee and I'm looking right now to see what else is in here. Remarks of Paul Warnke, Assistant Secretary of Defense. So I think a lot of this is subject files, um, which are essentially research files, where these were documents that um, Alice Langley, she had put together in order to learn about the topic. I happened to see a map that called out Iowa, and so now, I'm curious about what this, what these remarks are and why there's a map of Iowa. Uh, it's, it's entirely possible if, if this is congressional, um, congressional remarks that it's just a politician from China speaking. I, I don't seem to have a name for who is talking. Oh wait. Four, five, five, four. Three, two. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Oh, never mind. There's a cover page. I have discovered the information. <clears throat> Hold until released by the Subcommittee on Military Applications. Unclassified statement by Dr. John S. Foster, Jr. Director of Defense Research and Engineering for Subcommittee on Military Applications of Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. <clears throat> let's let's see what what there is. Mr. Chairman, it is a pleasure to appear before you today before describing some technical features of development, I would like to amplify Secretary uh, Knights's remarks on the history of our experience with ballistic missile defense. The original need to provide a defense against ballistic missiles came in the 1940s with the introduction of the German V-2 short-range ballistic rocket and the experience subsequent to World War II with this class of weapon. By the middle 50s, the potential threat to the United States had become serious because of the extension of missile ranges to intercontinental distances. The ICBM presented a unique threat because of its speed and thermonuclear warhead. Traveling at four miles a second, it would reach this country in 30 minutes, compared to the hours previously required by enemy bombers. For almost a decade, the ICBM was considered by many to be the ultimate weapon against which no defense was possible. However, by the mid-1950s, a concept had evolved that we hoped would be an effective defense. In 1956, the Nike Zeus development program was started. Its design resembled, in many respects, that of its predecessors, Nike Ajax and Nike Hercules, um, some of which on prior streams, we've looked at the flight characteristics of. Uh, radars were used to detect and track incoming targets 
and a rocket interceptor equipped with a nuclear warhead uh, was launched and guided to the target. A system was installed and tested at uh, Kwajalein in the mid-Pacific Ocean. Successful intercepts were made against actual ICBM targets launched from California in the early 1960s. <clears throat> the Zeus system used a family of mechanically slewed radars and consequently its traffic handling capability was severely limited. The only way to add the capability of handling simultaneous targets was to increase the number of radars. Consequently, the larger cities required as many as 30 to 40 radars, total of four different types, or different types. Uh, even with this larger number, the system could still be easily overwhelmed by the enemy's use of multiple objects, such as decoys or balloons, since each of them would have to be taken under fire. These defects were corrected in 1963 by the initiation of the Nike X concept. Phased array radars were introduced, which steer their beams electronically in a few millionths of a second. The traffic handling capability was thus vastly improved. Also, the Sprint missile, a very high acceleration interceptor, allowed launches to be delayed until after the cloud of objects had re-entered the atmosphere. The atmosphere slowed down the pieces of chaff and balloons and the radar could discriminate from them the warheads, which did not slow down until much lower altitude. In spite of these improvements, the system, when measured against the Soviet threat, had grave problems. As Mr. Uh, Knights stated, Nike X was originally conceived as a terminal defense system operating at moderate range. The battery at the most could defend one city. In the larger cities, more than one battery was required. The deployments were consequently very expensive, even if one were to attempt to defend a few of our cities. The cost to defend only 25 cities was about $10 billion of investment. To defend 50, about $20 billion. And any reasonable deployment would still leave hundreds of cities unprotected. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to skip a bit. So... In 1966, a new threat appeared. The probability that the Chinese People's Republic were developing an ICBM. Chinese-oriented deployment. So a Chinese-oriented deployment of this uh, anti-missile defense system named Sentinel. The four principal components being uh, the first radar is a perimeter acquisition radar, and the second is a missile sight radar. The two missile interceptors are called Spartan and Sprint. <clears throat> They're all capital letters, which makes me believe that they are abbreviations. And I wonder what words they smooshed together to make it spell Spartan and Sprint. Uh, PAR radar is used for long-range detection and acquisition. It is a large phased array type, which, as I said, means that its beam can be moved from one direction in the sky to another in a few millionths of a second. So we have a photograph of the radar. Okay. <laughs> the Sentinel components. The radar. So there were two, two types of radar, right? PAR and MSR. <clears throat> PAR was the perimeter acquisition radar, and MSR is missile sight radar. So I'm not certain, but I take that to mean perimeter acquisition radar would be the radar that, I, that identifies the incoming stuff. And the, the missile sight radar would be the radar that guides missiles that are launched. I don't know for certain, though. That's my guess. Uh, and then there's the two interceptor missiles, the Spartan and the Sprint. This is all kind of fascinating to me. 
I know very little about it, but it's interesting. A lovely 1960s aerial photograph photo, uh, copied onto printer paper. Ah, such definition. I think that's the um, MSR building based on the... Um... No, that might be the par, I'm not sure. No, that, well, so this is the MSR. So yeah, that was the par, but also, this one doesn't look real. This is a rendering. The other one actually looked like it could have been a photograph, but maybe it was also a rendering. Because like, this is mostly underground and they've illustrated it by carving away the ground so that you can see. Um, Spartan and Sprint. Spartan's the tall one. Sprint is the little one. I'm still trying to find out why there was a map of Iowa that we haven't quite gotten to, but it's the thing I'm most curious about. Let's see. Now let's put these components together and see how they work. Chart five shows an engagement. Obviously not to scale. First, the long-range par picks up the attacking warhead as it comes over the horizon. It tracks it for a minute or two, establishing its ballistic trajectory. You will appreciate that this is a job for an associated computer. Uh, these are remarks to Congress, and the date of this hearing was November 6th, 1967. Therefore, <clears throat> a job for an associated computer is not referring to a mechanical computing device uh, of the type that we refer to as computers today. It was talking about a person, most likely a female identified person, who sat in front of a calculating machine and did some or other calculations. That is the type of computer they would be providing a job for. A Spartan is then launched to the computed intercept point. It is guided by the MSR, and at the point of closest passage, the Spartan warhead detonates. So I was right, the PAR detects the incoming missile, and the MSR guides the outgoing missile that is sent in response. Wait, what about maps for secret reasons? Uh, because the Spartan has a high yield warhead, the lethal radius is large compared to the distance between the warhead and the incoming object, thus destroying it. As mentioned above, multiple intercepts can be made simultaneously. That is, several Spartans can be on their way toward various targets. I don't know why, but my brain said 300 uh, when um, several Spartans was mentioned. Probably a reference to more modern media. The next chart, secret maps. This is the declassified remarks. <clears throat> Finally, we get to learn why there's an X in the state of Iowa, roughly around where, like, that's roughly the area where the University of Northern Iowa is located. Cedar Falls area. Um, the next chart, number six, gives some idea of the coverage provided by a single Spartan battery. The elliptical area called a footprint is the area defended by one battery. 
All cities lying within that area will be protected. Hey, congrats to uh, the Northern Midwest. Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa, and Missouri, you all lucked out because you're fully protected by that one site. Uh, Puddle Glum, that was like my initial look, like when I first caught just a glimpse of it and what made me dig into this document was I saw an X on the state of Iowa with a circle around it and I was like, are they wargaming a missile hitting Iowa? Uh, and so, or I also thought that it could have had something to do with um, there have been multiple points throughout history where it has been suggested that the United States capital should be moved to Iowa rather than being on the East Coast. Uh, so I, I thought it might be one of the two. And instead, it was that everything within the circle is safe. So Wisconsin, safe, according to this. Well in their hypothetical situation where this site is built somewhere around Cedar Falls, Iowa. Um, the area extends a little farther to the south from the battery than to the north because ICBMs aimed at points south of the battery must pass over the battery on their way to the impact point. Yeah, Ohio's just out of range for this site. But, the next statement says, let's look at the whole country. Because the next thing we're going to look at is a map of the whole country as a whole. A few PARs are deployed close to our northern border. The next chart, number seven, shows how any missile coming from the north must pass through the PAR detection fans. Which for any missile originating on the other side of the planet, in the Northern Hemisphere, the fastest path to get here is across the North Pole. Like, heading up and over is faster than going around. Hi, Galara. Welcome. Uh, so, having the missile defense pointed northward would make a lot of strategic sense. And then the following chart, number eight, we see that the whole country is covered. The batteries are so located that their footprints, when combined, essentially cover the whole country. No one is left unprotected. Well, except for maybe Alaska and Hawaii, which aren't on the map. Um, and this is late enough that Hawaii is part of the country. Are we playing global thermonuclear war? I mean, sort of, Galara. Um, uh, we're looking at the Alice Langley Shea papers, uh, and she was a, um, a scholar and political advisor regarding um, military and nuclear capability in the Far East, including the USSR, uh, the Koreas, Japan, China, Vietnam, etc. Um, from uh, professionally active from uh, 1945 through 1979. So, Alaska might be covered. I don't know shadows. Uh, now I must emphasize that this type of defense is practical against small and relatively unsophisticated attacks. A massive attack can simply target as many ICBMs as a city at a city as are necessary to exhaust the Spartans within range. Then there's no defense. So if they send a lot of missiles, well then we're out of luck. Um, a sophisticated attack can destroy the radars and negate, de negate the defense. There are many options open to an offense to attack the defense. So I've just finished telling you how great this system is. Now I'm going to tell you exactly how they can defeat it. Um, 
We know them well, because we must know what is necessary to penetrate any Soviet ABM. Uh, but in the case of small and unsophisticated attacks, a de defense such as this is very effective. I turn now to a question often raised regarding the effect on our population of this ballistic missile defense, or if this ballistic if this ballistic missile defense were to be used. There are three main effects to consider. The flash, the blast, and the radioactivity. Oh, Puddle Glum, thank you for coming by. We will be ending in just a moment because uh, we have hit uh, time for the stream, so you won't miss much. Uh, it was great of you to stop in. And hopefully it was interesting. Uh, let's see. The flash, the blast, and the radioactivity. When the warhead explodes, there will be a bright flash of light. Most of the population underneath would barely notice it. If any were looking at that part of the sky, the flash could temporarily blind them. There would be no serious after effect. Because the high yield bursts take place above the atmosphere. There would be little or no blast. It would be like a sonic boom. There would be no significant fallout from the radiation emitted at the time of the explosion. If dozens of defensive bursts occurred, they would deposit radioactivity in the atmosphere. There would be no harmful short term effect and the long-term effect would be very similar to that experienced from our late atmospheric test series in 1962. Consequently, there is no need to greatly increase our fallout shelter program. Although the Sprint warhead would explode in the atmosphere, it would not cause damage because of its low yield. Finally, what level of fatalities can we expect? This last chart indicates that the fatalities we could suffer from various the fatalities we could suffer from various numbers of enemy missiles also shown is the situation with the sentinel system deployed as you can see in the event of a chinese attack we will have high assurance of no losses for many years later if the cpr threat grows in numbers and sophistication there could be some increase in the probability of fatalities. To obviate this, we intend to continue to pursue a vigorous research and development program to improve our defense. In this way, we can prolong the period over which we have high assurance of preventing damage to the U.S. Mr. Chairman, uh, and so then there's closing remarks. I wish, oh, I, I, we do know, I just forgot. I was like, I wish we knew who gave these remarks, but we did know. I just forgot. Uh, that was a person who had a name. Unsurprisingly. Um, where did the cover page go? Uh, Dr. John S. Foster Jr., Director of Defense Research and Engineering for Subcommittee on Military Applications of Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Uh, that's who it was. So expected fatalities uh, if ch Chinese intercontinental ballistic missiles were to be uh, targeted and fired at the United States in late 1967. The chart is illustrative but not interpretable. There are pretty lines. There are some numbers. There is no scale given. There's only one scale on the chart, but it is a chart with both an X and a Y axis. So, and, and this is saying, I, the way this is oriented, this is 25, 
Chinese missiles, 50 Chinese missiles, 75 Chinese missiles, and 150 Chinese missiles. But there are no numbers to interpret the number of casualties. Like, this could be zero and this could be one, meaning one person would die. They have not provided any information to interpret this chart. I imagine it's intended to show that with no defense, the line is up here, and with the defense, the line is, is down here at the bottom. And that's great and all, but meaningless without any actual numbers on the y-axis. Uh, yeah, on the y-axis. Unsurprisingly, not not an uncommon uh, chart. Like, this was a chart uh, used in a presentation to the United States Congress. Many charts used in presentations to the United States Congress do not include the necessary information for the chart to actually mean anything. Um, so, that was not exactly strange. Um, okay, we do need to wind down. Um, so I'm gonna switch back to face here for a moment. I did want to pull up um, the information on next week's episode. <clears throat> if I can. <laughs> um, because I thought it would be fun and interesting to like actually, you know, instead of just saying what it is, I can show you uh, what's coming up. I have the power. Come on. <clears throat> so, coming up next week on uh, on <clears throat> Archival Adventures, Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, right here. We have the Hauser Institute of New York City. Uh, late 1920s, booklets and broadsides related to the Hauser Institute uh, of New York City, conducted by food scientist Benjamin Gaylord Hauser. Um, it is uh, going to be a pseudoscience fad diet kind of day. Um, it should be interesting. Um, it is one box instead of eight, so we might actually get to look at quite a bit of it. I don't know, but it sounds like a fun collection, and I hope that you might join me next week, um, to take a look at it. Um, let me prepare us for a raid. Um, I have not looked to see who we might go to, uh, but I imagine the usual suspects are probably on. So let me take a look. I hope that this was an interesting um, topic. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, there is so much more in this collection. It's always, all of it kind of neat. Um, okay, we could pop over to Steven, who is playing Power Wash Simulator. The Monterey Bay Aquarium is on, um, and they are, let's see, they have the shark cam today. Um, 
those are our typical stops. <laughs> Constantly astounded by the uh, amount of, the volume of information you just can't get online. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and set up the raid today for the aquarium, because shark cam sounds fun and interesting. Uh, so, let me go ahead and make that a thing that is going to happen. Monterey Aquarium. Um, we'll just pop in there with both channels. Yeah, so... Um, as always, thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, 16-Bit uh, Eric, for the raid. Um, hopefully, I will see you all in the future for more adventures in the archives. Um, and yeah, until I do, keep exploring history, everybody.